Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to European Movement Ireland's first webinar on EU jobs and traineeships. Great to see so many have joined this morning. I can see that some are still logging in there. Um, so hope you're all well and safe, um, obviously during these unprecedented times, that we at European Movement Ireland are kind of transforming our events and our schedule to an online format. So this webinar is the first in our series on EU jobs and traineeships. This morning's webinar will cover traineeships in the European Commission, in the European Parliament and in other EU institutions. I will also briefly talk about more permanent positions within the European institutions and then talk about temporary positions within EU institutions and other agencies. Throughout this webinar, you'll see a Q&A button on your screens. Feel free to put your questions in there and towards the end of the webinar, I'm happy to answer your questions. So just a little bit about myself. So my name is Kieran Murray and I'm the Events and Grad Officer at European Movement Ireland. I've previously worked in the European Parliament in GG Finns and I'm a graduate from UCD with Commerce International German. So my background has been primarily kind of finance business um, with public affairs as well. So throughout this webinar, you'll see that the EU institutions look out for various types of backgrounds, not only look for people with EU law background, but with a vast array of different backgrounds from different disciplines. So just a little bit about European Movement Ireland for some of you who may not be familiar. We are the longest serving organisation um, in Ireland for EU affairs. And we were founded in 1954. And our main kind of mission and our goal is to strengthen the connection between all sectors in Irish society and Europe. We provide factual information um, about EU affairs and how Ireland's position is in the EU. We also work on a wide range of projects. For example, our educational program, the Blue Star Program, which educates primary schools um, to the learning of EU culture and identity. We also work on the future of Europe with the Department of Foreign Affairs and have been hosting citizens' dialogues through the whole of Ireland. We also do policy briefings as well as events in Ireland and in Brussels as well. So European Movement Ireland's Grad Jobs in Europe campaign. So this is one of our main pillars on our, on our, educational, on our educational platforms. We provide guidance and advice to Irish students who are looking to work in EU institutions or around the EU system. Every Thursday, some of you may be familiar with our EU jobs, tra traineeship jobs list. This is kind of one of a kind throughout Europe where every Thursday in your inbox, you will receive all the latest job information and offers from Paris, Brussels, Berlin and Ireland as a one click away. So I advise you to look on our website at our weekly jobs list and just to su subscribe on our list there. As well as that, we have our green book. So the Green Book is now in its 13th year. It provides practical information for graduates and students looking for a career in the EU institutions and further afield. The book is available on our website to download and it gives a good outline of the key dates for applications that are coming up and gives some practical information on how to kind of how to kind of set yourself up in Brussels, in Luxembourg or Strasbourg. So it's really good information there and I really strongly advise you to a, sign up to our jobs list for every week and to have a look at our green book as well. As part of our EU jobs campaign, we are part of the Department of Foreign Affairs um, steering committee on EU jobs. And this is, this is led by the Minister of State for European Affairs, Helen McEntee. So the EU, so the Department of Foreign Affairs also have a website at dfa.ie forward slash EU jobs. And here you'll find really good practical tips for pursuing careers in the EU and kind of what channels to go. So I'd really encourage you to visit that website there. Also, the permanent representation of the, of the EU to, um, in, our, in Brussels um, always provides good information to people who are maybe on the ground in Brussels. And um, they're always really available for your questions and queries. And from time to time, they hold information sessions on more permanent contracts. So keep an eye out for the perm rep in Brussels as well. So is it a good time to apply? So there has been a demographic lift in the past few years and more Irish officials um, are needed to trade the EU institutions. There's been a lot of retirements in the past five to 10 years. However, the 
the influx of Irish graduates isn't really being um, isn't really being on a large scale. So this needs to kind of up the numbers here to make sure that the Irish have a good footprint at the top level of the European Union. Ireland is now the largest speaking member state along with Malta. So this is a direct advantage for Irish graduates and students to work across institutions. However, though, but foreign languages do remain a challenge. And just to note, or just to remember that the European Union has 24 official languages and that Irish is one of them. So a lot of people could have Irish from Leaving Cert or through their university. So don't forget that you can use your Irish as well, um, as well as the English as your mother tongue, but never forget that Irish is a recognised language and there are positions available um, throughout at the moment in the institutions looking for fluent Irish speakers. So just to briefly touch upon um, Irish success in Brussels. Um, so there's, out of eight Secretary Generals of the European Commission, two of them have been Irish, David O'Sullivan and Catherine Day. So this is quite significant for two Irish people out of eight to be at the top level of the European Commission. However, uh, we still need more and more graduates and students to apply in order to replicate this in the coming years to come. Currently, at the moment, we have Irish people holding positions, the European Ombudsman, that's Emily O'Reilly, and various others across the Commission, the Commission of Regions, and the European Parliament. So it's quite a lot of Irish footprint over there, but again, we still need to, to bring that up to a, a sustainable level. So briefly, I'm going to touch on the traineeships. So the traineeships are a good stepping stone to further your career in the EU. I'm going to briefly talk about the European Commission, the Parliament, the Council and the Court of Auditors. So the European Commission, so the kind of main function of the Commission is to propose new laws, they manage EU policy and they allocate EU funding. So within the Commission they offer a called a Blue Book traineeship and these offers are available in all Director Generals of the European Commission. The Blue Book traineeship is probably one of the most prestigious and uh, traineeship that you could have on your CV and is quite competitive. However, the work is very rewarding um, and you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be gaining a lot of good, valuable experience with the, the European Commission. The Commission have two uh, traineeship periods and they run from the 1st of March to the 31st of July, where you would, where you would apply in the July previously before that and the 1st of October to 20th of February, and you would apply January before that time period. So with the commission, it is about six to seven months by the time you send your application in to when you actually start um, your traineeship. The application is all online, um, and it has good details on the European Commission traineeship website of how to kind of complete your application in a timely manner and to what documents that you would need. They offer traineeships in administrative roles and in translation as well. So just make sure on your application that you click the correct one that you want to apply for. They are open to all EU citizens, and as well as that, they provide limited number of places that's allocated to non-EU nationals. Regarding the language requirements, the European Commission require at least one, to have at least one of the three working languages. So that would be English, French, or German, and that would be to a C1, C2 level. So the European framework of languages states out from A to C and A kind of be beginner level to C be quite fluent. So you can always do self-tests um, on your own proficiency with languages by just going onto Google and typing the European framework um, and you can go through the various different roles there. So approximately the commission, every intake, they take in around 15 trainees. So over the year of the two periods, you have about 30 traineeships and 30 trainees from Ireland that would be positioned. So next is the European Parliament. So the European Parliament, as so we very well know, that is directly elected. And obviously last year we held the European elections across the whole of Europe. It's very much a legislative role um, and they pass the laws together with the Council of the EU that are kind of be based on the Commission's proposals. So in the European Parliament, the Robert Schumann traineeship holds various amounts of traineeships in different director generals. So, for example, the Presidency Office, Translation Services, Finance, Internal Policy Un of the Union. And again, similar to the Commission, they hold two application periods and two traineeship intakes every year. So their traineeships intakes are from March to July and you apply in November beforehand and in October and February and you apply June beforehand. 
applicants must have a thorough knowledge of one of the EU official languages. So that's kind of a little bit different to the Commission. They're not strictly on the C1, C2 proficiency level, but they're saying have a very good thorough knowledge of EU language. And as well as that, with their applications, if you have it, you'd be at a distinct advantage if you have a second language as well. So you apply for these traineeship offers via their website as well. So from my own experience, I have worked in the European Parliament in DG Fins, and it really was a great experience to see how the Parliament, the Commission and the Council all work together and how the whole system really works. Uh, from my own experience, I got to visit Strasbourg twice to see how the Parliament works down in Strasbourg. And you're very much as a trainee, you're very much involved in the team um, and the processes that go in the different areas you're there. You're afforded time to go off to commission meetings and to take notes for your head of unit. So it's very much a really great experience. Um, as well as kind of being based in Brussels um, on a Friday, it's very quick and easy to be able to hop on a train and an hour away, you could be in Paris or somewhere else in Germany. So it's a really great mobility. And I really strongly advise everyone watching today to like take into account um, to apply for these traineeship positions. So then next then within the parliament, obviously the MEPs um, would hire staff and trainees. Now this is very much done on their own system and their own conditions. The European Parliament is looking to streamline this in the coming years to have kind of one set organization that deals with all traineeships for MEPs and for the administrative roles. So it's advised what to start looking perhaps in your own constituency, but also look beyond look at what committees that the MEPs are on and maybe align what their committees are with your own experience and your own education. Just a little point here that a lot of people seem to maybe go for their own constituency or their own national MEPs. It's advisable to look outside as well and to look at MEPs across the whole of Europe. All MEPs look for native English speakers. So I know a few people who have worked for Maltese MEPs, for German MEPs, so never discount that, always apply for MEPs across, across the union. So then moving next on then to the Council um, of the European Union. So this is, this is the main voice of the EU member governments and they negotiate and adopt EU laws together with the European Parliament based on the proposals from the European Commission. So there again, the intake there for the, for the Council of the European Union their intake is from September to January and you apply between February and March. So unfortunately, those applications have just closed there in March um, and they'll be sifting through those applications in order to uh, give people um, enough time to start in September. These trainships take place in the General Secretariat of the Council and kind of like the day of what you'll be doing will be very much preparing meetings, uh, drafting minutes, and you'll be attending meetings of council bodies uh, and permanent representatives of governments of member EU states. The requirement again for language, so you can very much see languages is very much a key common theme throughout this webinar today. Um, and kind of for me to kind of focus that, um, even though having English as your mother tongue, that they still require an, an, an extra language as well. So in the council, they require a very good knowledge of at least two EU official languages in which English or French is required as these are the main working languages. So it all depends on the area you go into or the DGs that you work in, that some of them might be very much working in French or some might be working in English. So it's very much depending on the different institutions and the different departments that will be working in as well as the council, um, they obviously hold the rotation uh, presidency of the EU. So at the moment, that's Croatia and Germany are due to pick that up in July uh, for six months. So by working in the council, you'll really be seeing firsthand the presidency of the EU and how that rotates and how other member government states deal with each other um, throughout the six month period. And then briefly moving on to the European Court of Auditors. So the European Court of Auditors, their main role is to improve EU financial management and promote accountability and transparency. So it's not, they're not, they don't just look for kind of like people with specific backgrounds in finance, they look for all backgrounds. And um, so they are based in Luxembourg and their trainships are offered from three to five months. So they've got three kind of um, intakes. So from April to May, where you're from, so, so you apply from April to May uh, for September, 2020, 
um, and then September to October for February 2021 and so on. So at the moment, the Court of Auditors do have open applications and um, they run until the 31st of May. Um, so on our jobs list, you'll be able to see that and the criteria um, for their application that you will need to go by. You'll need a thorough knowledge of one official language of the European Union and a satisfactory knowledge of at least one other official EU language. And just to let you know that um, our next webinar will be based on the European Court of Auditors. We're hopefully going to be joined with the Irish member of the Court of Auditors, Tony Murphy. So this at the beginning of May, we hope to bring you another webinar on the European Court of Auditors. It's very timely as the applications are closing date is the end of May. So hopefully myself and Tony will be able to kind of give an overview of the Court of Auditors and kind of what to expect um, from a day in a traineeship. But I'll give you more details of that towards the end of today's webinar. Again, other EU institutions. So apart from those main EU institutions that I just kind of talked about, there are many other EU institutions. For example, the Commission of the Regions, um, the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, and don't forget that there's over 40 EU agencies all across Europe. Um, and in Dublin here, we have got Eurofound. And Eurofound, their kind of work is the improvement of living and working conditions throughout the EU. Um, and they are based in Lockenstown, South Dublin. So check on their website. They do offer traineeship periods um, throughout the year. So keep an eye on their website and on our jobs list as well. So outside of the EU institutions, Brussels and Strasbourg and Luxembourg has hundreds of organisations that privately work around these, these institutions. They've got NGOs, we've got trade bodies, we've got think tanks, umbrella organisations. So never discount these organisations. And these are a great way to work um, in the EU affairs field. A lot of these organisations would have representation in the parliament, in the commission. And you'll be holding meetings daily with MEPs um, and other officials. So, for example, European Movement International, who is a European Movement Ireland's umbrella organization, have an office in Brussels. And from time to time, they do have traineeships available. IBEC Europe as well, based in Europe. Um, and again, throughout the year, they do have positions available to offer. So always think outside as well. As I said there's hundreds of these organizations uh, looking for professionals and graduates uh, to work in Brussels, Strasbourg and Luxembourg. So just some tips for applying for traineeships. So I suppose like at the moment, we're all at home kind of either working or studying. So I say like use this time wisely to really research on the traineeships and the institutions that you want to work for. Um, I keep kind of stress enough that the amount of research you do will really enhance your application. Apply for multiple traineeships and don't limit yourself to the most popular traineeships. Um, like I'll see the commission apparently would be quite popular, but there are many institutions and organizations to apply for, and even the court of auditors as well. I say tailor your application. Don't really do one application that will suit all. Like these applications need to be um, in line with the requirements that are set out in the application um, form and to really outline your skills and to really, really emphasize that English is your mother tongue. Um, so when they're sifting through all the applications that they see that you are a native English speaker and that would be um, a, an advantage to yourself. And make sure you spend time on it. For a lot of these traineeships, some of them could last for four to five weeks, the application period. Like, don't rush your applications. Like, remember, you have to stand out around 15,000 applications. So take that time um, and do the research wisely to, to look into the applications. And lastly, then proofread. Um, proofread your application, if possible, give it to someone else to read over for you and let them have a look at it. Okay, they might be able to see one or two things that you can see. So they're kind of tips for the traineeships. As I said, with the traineeships, it's a good way to get into the EU institutions and into the, into the EU affairs. Um, it's a good stepping stone. And I'll briefly talk later on about kind of like what to expect kind of after the traineeship as well. So I'm going to briefly just move on to um, permanent positions within the EU um, and various other um, organizations. So the European Personnel Selection Office, which is commonly known as EPSO, is very similar to publicjobs.ie here in Ireland who administer the civil service uh, opportunities. 
So these recruit um, and have open competitions for any permanent positions within the EU institutions. So what they typically look for is young graduates and young professionals to work as administrators. Um, you will start off as a generous administration, an AD level, and this could be anywhere of drafting policy, researching, uh, attending high level senior management meetings. So it's a quite a varying amount of tasks that you'll be, you'll be doing. Um, again, they look for kind of auditors, translations, lawyer linguists. And again, like, as I said, within these institutions, like, it's not necessarily just to come and look for someone with EU affairs. Like, they look for scientists, engineers. There are many, many disciplines that they look for. So an AD5 would be an entry-level grade uh, with kind of like a degree. And AD7 would be someone with, one or, with a few years um, experience under their belt as well. So what qualifications do you need in order to apply for um, these uh, concours? So you must have completed your university study of at least three years. Um, you must have thorough knowledge of one of the official EU languages. And again, that's level C1. So if you think back to the European framework, um, have a look at that and that'll kind of give you a good idea to the fluency is required. Add a satisfactory knowledge of a second language, which would be B2 level of the official EU language. Obviously, there are 24 EU languages. So just have a look through there to see which languages are applicable. And then you must be a European citizen. So with, with the applications, EPSO always release a competition notice. And it's very important to read this competition notice as it outlines all the um, information required for your application. Some competition notices may require a specific language so always just read through that first before you um, before you progress with your application so the typical um, process or procedure for the permanent positions at the european institutions uh, again it's all done via the epso website where you log on and you complete an online form so i just say to people that um, when you're logging on to EPSO, only create one account. I've heard of people who have forgotten their passwords and create another account, but this seems to not be able to recognize that as the same person. Um, so only kind of create one account and maybe just do the password reset reminder. Um, so once you set up your kind of profile, you'll be asked to do an application, online application form for a specific uh, position that you're applying for. If successful, um, you are then contacted um, to book a slot for a computer-based test, and these will be held in your home EU country. And these tests will be varying, uh, computer-based skill tests will be varying throughout your two languages, which you include on your application. So on your application, you will be asked for language one and language two, um, and you'll be asked then, that will continue to write your application. So I'll talk a little bit more about that just in a second. And then stage three then will be an e-tray exercise, which will be held in your language number two in a designated test center. This is very much a live situational um, inbox where you'll have to work out solutions to various different problems. And then stage four is a full or half day assessment center in Brussels in your second language. And this will be based on group interviews and one-to-one -one interviews and kind of a group work exercise as well. And then stage five, um, when successful candidates will be placed on a reserve list for a year, and as positions become freely available, they would then be called upon uh, for that list. So just to reiterate, just with the um, language requirement, so on your application, let's say, for example, I've got as the native speaker is English and my second language is German. So I could put down language one be English and language two German. So that would mean my stage one and half of stage two will be done through English and then the rest of the stage is true German. However, for some people, if they're comfortable with this, you can always flip the languages around so that you don't have to have language one as your native language or native speaker language. So in my instance, I could put down language one German and language two English. So that would mean then stage one and stage two would be done through German and stage three and crucially stage four which is the day assessment and the interviews could be done through English. And some people might be more comfortable uh, to get a better success rate out of that. So that's again, up to the individual themselves to see if they're more comfortable with that. But there's a little trick that people can use um, to try and advance further in these competitions. 
So what to expect kind of conditions um, in the EU institutions? So you could be based in Brussels, Luxembourg, Strasbourg, or any EU member state. And the monthly salary for an AD5, so that's the incoming graduate level, will be around 4,500 per month uh, based on a 40 hours working week. So the great thing is that you have job mobility, you could freely travel around the EU and work in different offices. You're very much working in an international work environment when I worked in the European Parliament, I was on a team of 40 people and I was the only native English language speaker on that team, but a varying amount of um, colleagues from all around Europe um, and some of them had four or five different languages. It was great to be able to work in that international environment. And the institutions provide training courses to all staff and they provide language courses. Um, and just to note that before your first promotion, you must prove a skill in the third EU language. So that's just a few of the kind of benefits uh, and conditions that you would hope to see within the EU institutions by applying for the permanent positions. So there are temporary positions. Um, and again, some of these are run by the European Personnel Selection Office as well. So the temporary agents, now these are very much, these can range from six to 12 months, up to a year or two, and these are run by individual e-institutions and agencies. So it's very much advisable to have a look at their websites just to see, uh, as well as our jobs list as well, just to see what available uh, positions are, are, are on their websites. As well as that, the contractual agents, otherwise known as CAST, these are um, these are these could be kind of fixed term uh, contract positions and these are available on the EPSO website and sometimes um, they can be just a mere send in your CV and they have a kind of a pool of CVs and they pick out kind of what certain um, backgrounds they're looking for or it could be computer computer based tests followed by an interview so they're just kind of different um, other ways of getting around um, it's kind of medium come to short term if you wanted to work in more temporary position. And I'd advise everyone to have a look at the EPSO website there. It's epso-europa.eu. Uh, it's a really comprehensive website. It uh, gives you all the details of the Concour, of the open competitions, and all the necessary um, details that you need to apply for. So what opportunities are available at the moment? Um, so the current opportunities um, are the European Court of Orders uh, for the traineeship, and that deadline is the 31st of May. And as well as that, the Committee of the Regions, um, they're looking for trainees at the moment, and the deadline is the 31st of September. So you kind of have the summer kind of to apply for that. But I'd always say is take your time with your applications um, and get them in early as, enough, as much as you can as well. And as well as that, um, coming over the summer on the 1st of June, the European Parliament will open up their traineeship positions again. Um, and the European Commission uh, will open up their traineeships on the 16th of July. Um, so keep an eye out for them. Um, and of course, we'll always have on our jobs list as well. So always subscribe to our jobs list and follow us on the usual social media. So then just a few useful websites. So European Movement um, .ie there. Um, our Twitter handle is at EM Ireland. So we have a comprehensive grads jobs lifting Europe uh, page there dedicated to the Green Book. And you can subscribe on our website. As I was saying about the Department of Foreign Affairs, their website there, EU Jobs, uh, dfa.ie forward slash EU Jobs, and their Twitter handle is at EU Jobs Ireland. That's a great. Um, Twitter handle where all the jobs are kind of retweeted as a really good comprehensive list and they kind of work closely with us with our jobs list as well so it's really good um, it really goes to have that as well and then lastly the EPSO website um, for the permanent positions and their Twitter handle is at EU underscore careers so as I was saying there um, our next upcoming webinar on EU jobs and traineeships is going to be with the European Court of Orders and the Irish member, Tony Murphy. And we're going to look into have that in early May 2020 with more details to follow um, in the coming few days. So if you're looking to apply for that, it'd be a great opportunity to hear directly from Tony in the Court of Orders. And I know I met him last year and he really wants more Irish people to apply uh, for the positions. Uh, so I think it'd be a great um, webinar just to hear from Tony. You'll get first-hand 
the work of the EU, of, of the Court of Auditors, and kind of what to expect um, what to expect from your work there as well. So um, those details will follow soon, but uh, for everyone who attends today, we can forward on the invitation in the coming days and just to check on our social media as well for details of that coming up soon. So just um, thank everyone for joining for our first webinar today. Um, as I said, this is part of a series of webinars that we're going to do for an EU jobs, as well as um, other events throughout European Movement Ireland. So I know some people have been asking questions